So this is joint with Dick Hodd, who's sitting right there and um, comes to the Q&A. Basically, Dick is going to answer all the questions that I cannot answer. I should also say that uh, the views expressed here are views and they're not the views of the Minneapolis Fed or the Federal Reserve System. So uh, Toby kind of gave you a warm-up on uh, what's going on with the Fed. So let me just jump uh, right into this uh, talk and, and, and start with this uh, a picture of the balance sheet. This goes back to January uh, 2007. I want to first call your attention to um, the way things were in around 2007 before we fell into the worst uh, recession since the Great Depression. As you know, balance sheets have uh, two components. There's an asset side and a liability side. And the nice thing about this picture is you've got assets above the zero line and liabilities below the zero line. So prior to uh, the Great Recession, uh, the Fed's balance sheet was very plain vanilla. So let's look at the asset side, and you can see these, these bluish gray lines. If you kind of go over to the right, you see they're basically treasury securities. So that's, those were the assets uh, the Fed held, uh, treasury securities. Then if you look below the zero line on the liability side, you see this green thing. Uh, that's uh, Federal Reserve notes in circulation. That's just currency. So it was a very simple balance sheet. The Fed issued currency, and it backed that currency with uh, treasury securities. Not only that, you can see if you look at these lines as, it, as you kind of move time forward, the balance sheet was growing, but at a, at a slow rate, you know, roughly 4 or 5% a, a year. So that's the way things were until the Great Recession hit. And then you see the balance sheet uh, e expanding uh, pretty enormously. So let me, not only did it expand enormously, but the composition of the balance sheet changed. So let me talk about that. Starting with the uh, asset side, first of all, you see the, those bluish gray lines that I pointed to earlier. Treasury securities, they expanded a lot, um, especially in the last two or three years. But in addition, if you look at the, just above that, you see a, a category called agency debt and mortgage-backed securities. That, uh, that basically was non-existent on the uh, asset side of the balance sheet, and that's uh, grown uh, quite a bit. It's now on the order of uh, one, $1 trillion. So basically on the asset side, uh, a lot more treasuries, but in addition, um, uh, the Fed started buying these uh, mortgage-backed securities. So that's how it expanded on the asset side. Let's turn to the liability side. You can see that cash and currency in circulation expanded, but not in any really uh, unusual rate. The big change on the liability side is this thing called deposits of depository institutions and other uh, deposits. Uh, basically, these things uh, there are, um, it's a long way, uh, a long winded way of saying uh, they're reserves. And uh, reserves are essentially banks' deposits at the Fed. So, just like we have deposits at uh, regular banks, these regular banks hold deposits at the Fed. Those deposits are called reserves. So, that's a term I'm going to use over and over in this uh, talk. Um, so I'm going to repeat that definition um, over and over uh, as well. But prior to the crisis, these reserves, you can actually see they're, they were a very thin line, about 10 or 20 billion. And now they're more on the order of 2.5 trillion. So uh, they, those on the liability side, that's where the big expansion has occurred. When you add it all up, you see um, as of uh, October 22nd, so as of a couple of weeks ago, the balance sheet is now up to about 3.8 trillion. It's almost five times as large as what it was uh, prior to the crisis. So big expansion of the balance sheet from under a trillion to uh, close to uh, four trillion. And that obviously has gotten a lot of people worried I've, uh, and concerned, and I'm sure you've heard these concerns. And I have three quotes here from uh, res what I'll call respectable people, uh, namely economist uh, type people. Uh, the planned asset purchases, risk, currency, debasement. Uh, Marty Feldstein was uh, President Reagan's uh, chief economic uh, advisor and a very uh, highly respected academic economist. S he said that inflation is a risk, um, even if it's not inevitable. Phil Graham, uh, former Senator Graham, and then John Taylor, uh, again, a very well-respected academic economist, uh, said that uh, this type of expansion would normally be a harbinger of inflation. So uh, lots of concerns out there, and these are from, as I said, what I, I would call uh, respectable uh, people. 
Um, one thing to note, though, is they use words like risk and harbinger. They're not using words like, we've got massive inflation now. And why are they not saying that? Um, because we don't have massive uh, inflation now. Uh, recent inflation has actually been quite uh, subdued. This is a picture of the Fed's preferred measure of the inflation rate, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, which is just a price index of a basket of goods that consumers, the households like you and I uh, purchase. That's the uh, blue line uh, called PCE headline for short. Goes back, this picture goes back to 1990. And uh, you see that uh, in fluctuations in the zero to 4% range, right at the time of the Great Recession, which is shaded in gray here, you see some big swings. Those were largely driven by uh, swings in energy prices. But overall, if you just kind of use your eyeballs as a metric, you can see that roughly around 2%. In fact, it's actually been a little bit less than 2 as I'll show in a, in a, in a second. The, you can get a better sense of the average inflation rate by looking at this core inflation rate, which um, is the same index, but it strips out uh, energy and uh, food. And you can see there that, uh, again, it's just been fluctuating in this, actually, this 1% to 2% one to range over the last five years. So despite this big expansion of the balance sheet, we have not seen a lot of inflation. Uh, what those guys that I quoted before, would they would add one small word to uh, what I just said, they would add yet. So that's kind of the question here is, are we going to uh, see it? And I'm going to try to persuade you that, um, you know, very unlikely, you can never say never, but uh, very unlikely because um, the Fed uh, has uh, some tools, and in particular a new tool that I'm going to talk about that uh, it can use to uh, fight uh, inflationary pressures. So that's uh, basically the uh, motivation and backdrop, and uh, the rest of the talk is going to uh, cover these three topics. The first one, which I actually think is the most important, is just to review the Fed's policy actions during the Great Recession and the subsequent uh, slow recovery, because this balance sheet expansion uh, it didn't happen in, in a vacuum. It didn't happen at the Fed's whim. It happened for specific uh, purposive reasons, and I want to uh, go into that and, and, and make sure that uh, we all uh, understand that. So then the second thing I'm going to talk about is just present the uh, logic and also some evidence uh, linking um, higher money growth, and in particular, bank reserves, which are a form of money, to uh, higher inflation. So some of this logic you're already familiar with, um, but I'm also going to talk about the logic in terms of how the, you know, the, the actual actions that the Fed does uh, mediated then through banks and how then that leads to uh, inflation. And then finally, uh, I'm going to talk about this new um, inflation fighting tool and um, how it works. Let me um, turn to this uh, first uh, topic, the Fed's um, policy actions during the uh, Great Recession and the subsequent uh, sluggish uh, recovery, which we're still in uh, right now, um, un unfortunately. So I'm going to start with two pictures of uh, some very key macroeconomic indicators. One of them is the uh, unemployment rate. And uh, this is a picture that goes back to 2007. You can see before the onset of the Great Recession, the unemployment rate was uh, under 5%. And then um, it rose um, very rapidly up to 10%. And uh, the recession officially ended uh, more than four years ago. And you can see the unemployment rate has come down, but at a very uh, slow pace. And it's still 7.2% uh, even, um, even now. And there's a sense in which this decline in the unemployment rate actually exaggerates the extent of the improvement in the labor market. Because to be unemployed, you have to be actively looking for work. And a lot of people um, have just simply stopped looking for work. They've uh, dropped out of the labor force. They're not counted uh, as unemployed. They've essentially gone from being unemployed to being uh, not employed or not in the labor force. So a lot of the decline in this unemployment rate is simply because people have stopped looking for work, not because they've actually found jobs. So, as I said, there's a sense in which this decline in the unemployment rate actually exaggerates the extent of the improvement in the labor market. So bottom line, there's been some improvement, but we still have a long uh, way to go in terms of unemployment. 
Let me turn to the other major um, macroeconomic indicator that the Fed looks at, and that's obviously the inflation rate. This is just a narrower snapshot of the picture I showed earlier. It only goes back to 2007. Um, and it, this covers only the headline index um, that covers all goods, including um, energy and food. And the main uh, um, takeaway I'd like you to uh, get from this picture is the average inflation rate since uh, September to the, of 2008 is 1.5%. And that's a number I want you to hold uh, for now because it's, um, I'm going to show uh, in, a, in a second that this is actually below um, what the Fed uh, wants to uh, achieve in, in terms of uh, inflation. So unemployment right now is um, too high and uh, inflation is actually a, a little bit uh, on, on the low side. So this, uh, um, so that's the kind of the economic uh, backdrop. Now let me take a step back and talk about the Fed's uh, goals and then the policy actions it took to um, achieve those goals. So the Fed has a dual mandate. This mandate is given to it by uh, Congress. And, in, and at times over the Fed's history in the past 100 years, uh, Congress has uh, modified that mandate. And in 1978, they kind of gave the most current version of it, uh, which was to uh, maximize employment and maintain uh, stable prices. So that's the mandate that the Fed has operated under uh, for about the last uh, 35 years. Now, those words are um, qualitative words. They're, they don't have a quantitative uh, metric associated with them. And recently, um, the Fed um, uh, put a number to uh, stable prices, and uh, it issued a statement in early of uh, 2012, and I, this, I think this was a big uh, achievement uh, for the Fed in that it basically defined stable prices as a 2% uh, inflation rate. So that's uh, what the Fed is defining as stable uh, prices, and the graph I showed earlier uh, showed that uh, the inflation rate is averaging 1.5%. Uh, so that's the sense in which uh, that gap is the sense in which the Fed is actually missing on the low side its uh, inflation uh, target. So um, to achieve the uh, dual mandate, we had that great recession where unemployment zoomed way up. Um, inflation kind of wasn't doing that much. I mean, it was kind of volatile, but kind of staying in this two or one five range. So to, to so unemployment was clearly the main issue, the main problem. And so what did the Fed do? Um, it initially used its conventional tool, this interest rate called the federal funds rate. This is kind of a esoteric rate in the sense that this is a rate that banks, that banks trade with each other uh, overnight um, for the purposes of maintaining the right amount of reserves that they hold at the Fed. I'll get into this later, but uh, there's a certain amount of reserves that they're required to hold at the Fed, and it depends on how many deposits uh, that they have at the bank. Sometimes if they get caught short, they have to pay a penal penalty. So to avoid that penalty, they trade with each other, and the interest rate that they charge each other is this federal funds rate. Now, the Fed can influence that rate uh, pretty closely, and that's the rate um, that, the, like I said, the Fed controls. And it sounds like it has nothing to do with auto loans or mortgage loan rates. But in fact, if the Fed uh, uh, manipulates that interest rate enough over a long enough period of time, it will spill over to auto loan rates and uh, mortgage rates. So, um, so the Fed has this, uh, this tool that they've used um, uh, uh, over you know, the last, uh, uh, you know, its main tool over the last 50 or 60 years, and um, it was at about 5%. Um, uh, at the onset of the uh, recession, and it quickly lowered that rate to zero um, by late 2008. Um, but uh, because this was, we were in the throes of a really bad uh, recession, um, the Fed decided uh, more uh, stimulus was needed. It couldn't really lower that interest rate below zero, the main reason being that we have cash and currency in the economy, and those, by definition, earn like zero interest. So if the Fed tried to lower these interest rates to like negative two or negative three, then banks and households and everyone else would just uh, basically um, try to convert their checking accounts and everything else into cash, right? So, so instead of paying banks to hold money, you just withdraw it and hold it as cash and get zero. So this is a problem that the Fed faces and lots of other central banks face, and it's called the zero lower bound problem. In some sense, it, would, it wanted interest rates to go negative, but it couldn't. 
uh, because of this, uh, um, because of the existence of cash and a currency which, which earn uh, zero uh, interest. So as of late 2008, then the Fed had to turn to some other tools. And I want to talk about these uh, two other uh, tools um, that were a part of its uh, unconventional monetary policy. The first tool uh, is called the uh, forward guidance. Uh, I'm just going to skip over this briefly because um, the next tool is the one that I'm going to focus on because that's the one that's tied to the balance sheet. But forward guidance basically focused on communicating conditions under which and for how long the Fed funds rate uh, will stay at uh, zero. So the basic idea here is if uh, you know the Fed funds rate is going to stay at zero for, say, six months and then it's going to start rising, that's going to have a different effect on your spending patterns than if you know the Fed funds rate is going to stay at zero for three years before it starts rising. And those two different scenarios clearly have different implications for auto loan rates and mortgage rates, um, et cetera. So what the Fed was trying to do here is convey uh, the economic conditions under which they're going to just keep the interest rate at zero. And what this uh, statement essentially says is, as long as the unemployment rate is above 6.5 and as long as inflation is under control, then the Fed funds rate is going to stay at zero. So again, it was trying to provide some clarity to um, private firms and citizens and households as to um, when, you know, how long uh, this rate uh, will stay at zero and when it might begin to rise. If you look carefully at this uh, language, um, this is the last thing I'll say about this uh, tool, you will see it doesn't say specifically that uh, once it hits six, once the unemployment rate hits six and a half, that the Fed funds rate will start uh, rising. It only says specifically that as long as unemployment is above six and a half, it won't rise. So in fact, there's sort of a public uh, discussion going on now involving different Fed presidents, including President Kocha Lakota, as well as uh, some of the governors on the uh, the, the Federal Reserve Board as to what to do when um, the unemployment rate hits 6.5, um, should um, uh, the Fed funds rate continue to stay at zero even as the unemployment rate goes below 6.5 and maybe even below uh, 6. So that's kind of an ongoing discussion and I'd be happy to, uh, Dick and I would be happy to talk about it further um, in the Q&A uh, part. But let me now go on to the second tool because this is the one that relates to the balance sheet. This was called large-scale asset purchases, or LSAPs. Um, in the media or the press, you hear something called QE. QE stands for quantitative easing. Um, that's the, the term that uh, um, uh, the media likes to use. In the, in the Fed, we like to call it uh, LSAPs. Uh, basically, what is it? Um, the Fed purchased um, long-term treasury securities and government-guaranteed uh, mortgage-backed securities. I showed kind of the picture of that on the balance sheet uh, earlier. Why did they do it? Um, when, when you're buying all these assets, you're basically um, imposing like a big demand for those assets. And like anything else, when you have a big demand for something, the price of them uh, goes up. Turns out when the price of assets like securities goes up, the flip side of it is the um, interest rates, uh, they tend to go down. So by buying these assets, we were lowering the interest rates on those securities. And then that in turn spills over um, to affect uh, interest rates like uh, mortgage rates. So by, um, I, I think the chain of logic is easiest to see with the mortgage-backed securities. By uh, putting a high price on the mortgage-backed securities, uh, that increases the incentive for banks to make loans, mortgage loans, and uh, then sell those mortgage loans to, to like Fannie and Freddie and get them packaged up into these uh, mortgage-backed securities. So, um, um, so the Fed's actions basically have uh, helped to drive down these long-term interest rates like uh, mortgage rates, and that's helped to stimulate uh, purchases of autos and homes, and also um, it's helped firms do capital uh, equipment and investment, and that has uh, um, spilled over more broadly to economic uh, activity. So that's kind of the goal of uh, what the Fed has done, and I think there's some good evidence that it has had some uh, impact uh, uh, in along the lines that I've uh, just described. How did the Fed pay for all these uh, assets? Basically, it pays for these assets by um, crediting the people that they purchased them from, essentially the banks, um, by crediting the banks' accounts of the Fed. Uh, 
So um, uh, in real life, the actual number of steps is a little bit longer, but kind of the, the shortcut version is the Fed bought these assets from the bank and then it credited the bank's uh, accounts at the uh, Fed and, and expanded uh, the bank's uh, deposits uh, at, the, at the Fed. Um, in other words, the reserves, that term I used earlier, um, increased. So that's how the Fed paid for it, and that's the sense in which uh, uh, when you hear uh, people say the money, the money supply has expanded, the balance sheet has expanded, what actually has happened is by, by the crediting the bank's accounts at the Fed, when they bought these uh, treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities, those reserves increased, and that increase in reserves is like this increase in uh, money. This is how the um, Fed's balance sheet has uh, more than quadrupled since late uh, 2007. So through this large-scale asset purchase program, um, buying all these treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities to reduce interest rates, which um, um, has helped to spur um, spending uh, on homes and, and uh, uh, cars, uh, et cetera, and then it paid for it by, again, um, creating these uh, bank uh, reserves. I'm going to turn uh, in a second to the logic by how increased money leads to increased uh, inflation. But uh, before I do that, I just wanted to show this table, and then I'm going to go back to that balance sheet picture. So this is a table of the different uh, Fed's uh, LSAP programs. And uh, uh, this is the one that we're doing right now. It's called Open-Ended QE or QE3. We started it in uh, September of last year. Basically, we're purchasing $85 billion in these longer-term treasuries and mortgage-backed securities every month until there's a sustained improvement in the labor market outlook uh, and or uh, we find that the cost of this program is becoming too high or the efficacy of the program is becoming uh, too low. So all of what I'm telling you is actually in the statement that the Fed uh, issues every time it has a meeting and was in, for example, the most recent uh, October uh, statement. So there's definitely been progress, as you, um, if you recall that unemployment picture that uh, I showed uh, earlier, you can see there's been progress since September 2012, but so far the uh, Fed has, uh, has not concluded that there ha has been a sustained improvement in the labor market outlook. So for now, it's continuing to do these uh, purchases. One of the questions that are out there discussed in public is when should the Fed start to curtail or stop these purchases? You might have seen this in the press. Uh, there, this is um, terminology called tapering. When is the Fed going to start to taper uh, its purchases? Um, that's still up in the air. Right now, um, um, we've purchased about $1 trillion since uh, September 2012, and um, it's, you know, it's uh, continuing uh, for now. So this is a picture of the balance sheet again, and uh, the expansion since late 2012, um, which you can see on the liability side down here, and then up top on the uh, asset side, that's the uh, latest uh, um, LSAP program that the Fed is uh, doing. So hopefully I've conveyed, uh, because the Fed has this dual mandate given it to it by Congress, because we were in this uh, worst recession since uh, the Great Depression, because, uh, through, because of our mandate, we had to do something about it, we quickly um, uh, used up our conventional tool. So hence, we had to resort to these unconventional tools. One of them was this uh, LSAP program. The goal of that was to drive down long-term interest rates and spur um, spending and economic activity to help us uh, achieve the dual mandate. One byproduct of that is we've got this big expanded uh, balance sheet. So that's kind of the summary of kind of what's happened in the last uh, five years and the implications for the uh, balance sheet. So now I want to turn to the second part of the uh, talk, which is just review the logic and then show some evidence on the traditional links uh, between uh, money and, in particular, bank reserves. Uh, because from this balance sheet, you can see that uh, you know this is this has all you know been in the list. All this growth has been in the last five years. You know, cash and currency really haven't grown that much. It's been these bank reserves. So I want to review the logic by which this growth in bank reserves uh, leads to um, in inflation. So this is kind of the traditional uh, logic. And uh, then the final part will be how that traditional logic uh, 
um, no longer holds because uh, the Fed has this new uh, tool to um, uh, prevent that logic from holding. So um, before I get to the traditional logic that involves the Fed and banks, let me just review this simple logic that I think we can all relate to. And uh, in this simple logic, forget about bank reserves um, and uh, forget even about a central bank. Just think about, and, and think about money as just cash and currency and think of a government that creates this currency and uh, if you have growth in this currency, that's going to lead to a growth in prices because you're going to have the situation of too much money chasing too few goods. And if you have really rapid money growth, you'll have a really rapid growth in prices or rapid uh, inflation. So this is a logic that I think we all um, understand. And um, I, now what I'm going to do is just uh, um, kind of repeat that logic, but um, mechanically through give some mechanics of how it happens in sort of today's world involving a central bank or the Fed in particular, as well as uh, banks and uh, households and uh, firms. So this logic involves three steps. And the first step um, is where the Fed does an open market purchase, what is called an open market purchase. The Fed buys treasuries from banks and pays for them by crediting the bank's accounts at the Fed. If this sounds a lot like the LSAT program, um, it's because it sort of is. I mean, uh, the only difference between the LSAT program and what the Fed traditionally did in the past is the extent of these purchases. The Fed just did a lot, has, has done a lot more in these last uh, five years. And then also some details on the maturities of the treasuries that the Fed uh, has purchased. Uh, in this uh, LSAT program, the Fed has bought uh, these longer term treasuries traditionally uh, the Fed just bought short-term treasuries like of a maturity of one year or uh, less. So some of the details are different, but this um, process is, um, uh, uh, the concept is very uh, similar. The Fed buys treasuries from banks and it credits the bank's accounts at the Fed, and hence uh, reserves uh, expand. So um, that's uh, step one. So step two, before I get into it, um, I have to make a very important point here, which is that prior to 2008, these reserves that banks held at the Fed, so the, the bank's uh, accounts at the Fed, they earn zero interest. Um, now, all these banks are required to hold a certain fraction of their deposits, like the deposits that you and I have at banks, a certain fraction of that um, these banks have to hold in reserve. Why? Because uh, in case you know, there's a, like a mini run or something and everybody wants to withdraw at the same time, you know, they need to have some stuff on hand to uh, handle that, to run and quell any potential uh, panic. And so that's, um, that's, why, um, that's the main reason why they're uh, required to hold some, uh, some uh, reserves. Now those reserves, as I said, earned uh, zero interest. So then to the extent that banks had excess reserves or more reserves than what they were required to hold, then they had an incentive to do something with them, in particular make loans and extend uh, credit because that uh, would yield a higher return than um, zero. And what you can think about um, these excess reserves, again, reserves beyond the required amount, you can think of them as licenses that banks have to expand uh, loans and uh, credit. So essentially step two is where once the Fed, suppose this bank um, originally had the right amount, it had this uh, required reserves um, and it was right at that level. When the Fed now buys a treasury, um, a, a treasury security from that bank and credits that bank's account at, 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 the, at the Fed, now that bank has excess reserves. Its it, reserves have increased and it's above the required amount, so there's this excess. And before 2008, it was earning zero interest. So there was an incentive to lend that out. And, uh, um, um, and, and so that's essentially what uh, um, step, uh, step two is. But um, this lending process, it, it doesn't end when the bank uh, makes a loan, um, say, to a household so it can buy a car. It turns out there's this mechanism called the money multiplier mechanism where um, that original loan and to buy a car uh, uh, leads to further loans and further uh, spending. So um, in earlier versions of this talk, I had this, um, this uh, balance sheet with lots of numbers on it. And uh, I was told that uh, it would be too much uh, for you guys, so uh, I'm going to now do it in terms of words. But if you want to see this balance sheet with lots of numbers, we'll be happy to uh, post it uh, later. So let me tell you how this money multiplier mechanism 
works uh, in, in terms of words. So the bank has these excess reserves. They give a loan to me so I can buy a car. I write a check, uh, pay that car company. That car company, Walzer Toyota, they deposit that check in their bank. Well, by depositing that check in their bank, the, bank, the deposits in that bank go up, but also on the other side of the bank's balance sheet, the reserves in that bank uh, go up as well. So, uh, so now that bank, let's pretend that bank originally had the right amount of reserves, this required amount and not one penny more. But now that they've deposited my check, that bank now has uh, extra reserves. It's got this excess. So um, in the old days when they earned zero interest on that, they had an incentive to take that, uh, uh, take that deposit and uh, lend out uh, most of it. So imagine Walzer's bank now gives a loan to somebody else so that they can uh, finance a uh, mortgage. Um, so that's a sense in which uh, this original loan to me now is showing up as another loan to somebody else uh, so that they can buy a house. Um, and the person who buys a house is going to write a check to the seller of the house. The seller of that house is going to deposit that check in their bank. Now their bank has extra deposits and also um, extra reserves that uh, their bank um, um, can now use to uh, extend additional loans and credit. So this is the sense in which um, this original loan and credit to me actually kind of, when it moves through the economy, it kind of gets circulated and recirculated uh, quite a few times and uh, uh, leading to more spending, uh, more credit, and actually also more uh, inflation. So that's the money multiplier uh, mechanism. Um, but kind of the bottom line is you get more spending activity, more economic activity, but you also get um, higher uh, prices uh, as well. So that's a three-step process. The Fed buys treasuries, a bank has excess reserves, um, it had a big incentive to lend them out, it does. Then there's this money multiplier mechanism where loans and spending lead to more loans and spending, and that ultimately translates to more economic activity and higher inflation. So let me um, turn to some evidence now um, uh, linking higher money um, growth to a higher inflation. I'm going to show two pieces of evidence, and then I'm going to look at what's been going on in the United States. So the first evidence is from a well-known paper involving a former colleague of ours, uh, Warren Weber. Um, and uh, this is a um, picture of uh, the money growth and inflation experiences of a number of countries, 110 countries. Each dot is a particular country, and each dot is a plot of the average annual money growth rate over a 30-year period between 1960 and 1990, uh, 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 plotted against its average inflation rate over that same time period. And if all these countries, um, if each country had the same money growth rate and the same, inf if its money growth rate was the same as its inflation rate, then they would all line up on this line, which is called the 45-degree uh, line. So you can see they don't all line up right on that line, but they're pretty um, close to that line, which essentially means that countries with higher money growth tend to also be countries with higher uh, inflation. And there's a statistical measure you can use called the correlation coefficient, which um, by definition ranges from negative one to positive one. And you can see that uh, uh, whether you use a narrow measure of money called M0 or a broader measure of money called M2, it's, they're very um, highly positively uh, correlated. Let me talk about M0 and M2 for a second uh, um, uh, because I'm going to come back to this later when I show evidence for the United States. M0 is called the, um, another word for M0 is the monetary base. It's defined as cash and currency plus these bank reserves that I've uh, talked about. And it's called the monetary base because it's sort of like the base um, upon which um, that money multiplier mechanism I talked about um, operates and hence leads to a broader um, expansion of the, of the uh, money in circulation. And M2 is one measure that captures this broader expansion of uh, money in circulation. M2 is cash plus checking accounts plus savings accounts plus a few other things. So um, it's a broader measure of money and uh, as I said before, it, it captures um, some of this money uh, multiplier um, in action. 
And the main point of these two numbers being very close to each other is that um, you know, at the time that Weber, Warren Weber and his co-author did this study, in some sense it didn't matter what measure of money you used, whether you used a narrow uh, measure of money, which uh, by the way corresponds essentially to the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet, or a broader measure of money, which includes all the checking and savings accounts that we have. Um, they were both very highly uh, correlated uh, with uh, inflation. So this is evidence when you look across countries uh, I now want to turn to a second piece of evidence, is, which is looking at a single country, but um, over time, um, Argentina had a big uh, hyperinflation around 1990. And uh, um, look at the y-axis. These are in percent. So in 1990, it was 2,500 percent. And in fact, in 1990, it was actually higher than that. But to kind of fit it all in a picture, we sort of smoothed things out by taking five-year averages. So basically, they had a, around 1990, the five-year average inflation rate was over 2,000%. So um, the point of this picture, though, is to show that the money growth, the growth in this monetary base, or their version of their central bank's uh, balance sheet, um, and the growth in the price level were very highly correlated. When the money growth was very high, the prices rose very rapidly. When the money growth was low, the prices rose at a low rate. So this is um, you know, sort of further evidence that sort of shows that the traditional way of thinking uh, that we had about money and inflation, it seems to, you know, it seems to uh, work. Um, uh, the logic uh, um, holds up well in, this, in these uh, data uh, experiences that I've shown you. Um, but now let's um, look at the evidence for the United States. So this is a picture of uh, those two uh, measures of money that I talked about, the growth rates of the two measures of money that I talked about, and also this um, headline uh, personal consumption expenditure, um, uh, the growth rate of those uh, of that personal consumption expenditure price index or the inflation rate. The orange line is what I showed earlier um, in the earlier inflation tables. It looks a little bit different because again, um, we've sort of smoothed it out by taking five-year averages. So each point is kind of the average inflation rate over the previous uh, five years. So until 2008, you can see that the two measures of money growth in, in uh, green and blue, um, um, not only did they track each other, they also tracked uh, the inflation rate. You know, not you know, tightly one for one, but roughly you know, they, they moved together. But then you can see um, since um, 2008, there's been sort of a divergence between the money base, which uh, as I said before, because the money base is um, cash plus bank reserves, it's essentially the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet. So, that blue line essentially captures the expansion of the Fed's balance sheet that I showed earlier. That measure of money has grown really rapidly, but this broader measure of money checking a, that includes checking accounts and savings accounts, that has not grown so rapidly. And uh, what you can see from this picture is that the, the, it's the broader measure of money that's tied to our inflation rate and not uh, the narrow uh, measure of money. And so what I want to talk to, uh, what I want to turn to now is um, essentially an explanation of why, um, uh, why we have this uh, divergence. And it's related to this uh, new tool that the Fed has um, to uh, prevent uh, excessive inflation. And uh, this new tool is that the Fed can now pay interest on reserves. I said before that um, prior to 2008, the Fed could not, uh, uh, banks did not earn any interest on the reserves. They earned zero on them, but um, in October of 2008, Congress gave the Fed authority to pay uh, interest uh, on those uh, reserves. And why did they do it? Uh, mainly because it turns out that banks, um, uh, when, when they were earning zero interest on their reserves, essentially they were paying a tax to hold uh, those reserves at the Fed. And this tax uh, is not efficient and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and basically um, we were able to persuade Congress of that and uh, Congress now, um, uh, as of 2008, uh, they, they allowed us to uh, pay interest now on these banks' uh, deposits uh, at the Fed or on uh, reserves. So it was done really as a way to help improve uh, efficiency, um, efficiency in the banking system. But uh, in addition, um, 
not only do we pay interest on those required reserves, we're paying interest on even the uh, excess reserves that banks have. And why are we doing that? Because it helps us manage our, uh, our traditional tool, this uh, federal uh, funds rate. So right now we're paying interest on both the required reserves and the excess reserves. What interest are we paying? 0.25%, um, uh, which doesn't sound like very much, but um, it is enough for banks to keep those reserves um, at, the, uh, at the Fed. So let me now talk about, and I'm getting kind of towards the end here, this slide and the next slide are, um, so to speak, the money slides in terms of explaining how the Fed can uh, control inflation with this uh, new tool. It turns out the logic of this is actually very similar to um, logic that uh, you're probably already uh, familiar with. But um, let me start with the money multiplier process that I, I talked about earlier. That's a key force that uh, contributes to inflation to the extent that uh, you, know, you had uh, these loans leading to spending, the spending leading to deposits. Those deposits imply extra reserves. The banks take those extra reserves, they make more loans, which leads to more spending, et cetera, et cetera. All that extra spending is kind of like too much money chasing too few goods, and that's how you get uh, inflation. But now, um, uh, by appropriately adjusting this interest on reserves, the Fed can ensure that this money multiplier process, uh, where those excess reserves are converted into loans and credit, and then more loans and credit, et cetera, um, that can be kind of cut off or curtailed uh, before it gets um, out, of, out of control. And how does it do that? It's, it's uh, very simply, if it rate, let's say we're in a setting, let me take a step back for a moment. I apologize, I'm gonna kind of ask you to turn 30 degrees here. What I'm talking about now is uh, a scenario that's not 2013, November 5th or November 6th. Um, it's really like hopefully sooner than later, but it's, some, it's at some point in the future where the economy is doing better, where um, market interest rates are kind of rising, where people are starting to get maybe concerned about inflation. Um, that's the scenario I'm laying out. Hopefully this is a scenario that's, uh, as I said, sooner um, rather than uh, later. So it's not really where we are now where we're still struggling in uh, our recovery. We're, I'm talking about, uh, about a world where um, people are just more optimistic, there's more capital investment going on, consumption, consumer spending is rising, our, our GDP growth rate, which is our broad, the broadest measure of economic activity, the growth rate of that is more than the 2% that we've had over the last five years. The unemployment rate is going down for the right reasons that lots of jobs are being created. You know, um, that's the scenario I'm talking about, which is sort of what I would call a normal recovery from a recession not this uh, sluggish recovery that we've had. So, you know, maybe this is gonna happen a year from now, maybe six months from now, maybe two years from now. That's the setting I want you to think about when we think about this uh, right now. So I apologize for not uh, laying out that uh, setting earlier, but um, that's the setting. And my point is that um, if we raise, if the Fed raises that interest uh, on reserves, let's say from zero or 0.25%, to let's just say it raises it to 3%, you know, that's going to discourage these banks from making these loans because uh, let's say the bank can make a 4% uh, auto loan. Um, uh, you know, 4% uh, on an auto loan is greater than 3% uh, this interest on reserves, but 4% um, auto loan has a risk to it that uh, you know that uh, the person doesn't uh, pay it back. Whereas this 3% is a is a risk-free uh, rate. So when the interest on reserves was zero, maybe the bank would make that 4% auto loan. But if the interest on reserves is 3%, maybe the bank will decide to forego that auto loan and will just keep the money parked at the Fed. So that's the point. By raising that interest on reserves we can incentivize the banks not to make that uh, extra loan and consequently to break that money multiplier process and uh, prevent uh, excessive inflation. So that's, uh, that's how it works. It's uh, fairly straightforward. We basically provide kind of an alternative vehicle for banks to use their resources and in particular their excess uh, reserves. And if we can do it in the right way, you know, we can prevent 
um, excessive inflation from uh, happening. So that's it. That's the uh, punchline to this uh, talk. That's how this uh, tool, this new tool, interest on reserves, can prevent uh, excessive inflation. So let me uh, move to the wrap up by talking about two more themes, and then I'll stop and uh, take uh, questions. Um, but before I move to those two more themes, let me try to reconcile this uh, picture here. What this picture says is that, you know, how do we reconcile this really rapid growth in the money base with almost no growth in uh, M2? Basically, what it says is that interest rate that the Fed is paying, even though it's very low um, on its reserves, this 0.25% I mentioned earlier, it's enough to uh, discourage banks from making a lot of loans. And because they're not making a lot of loans, um, we're not seeing a big expansion in checking accounts, you know, in deposits and, and in savings accounts. And that's why this M2 growth, the green line, is, is not that high. So, uh, um, uh, so that hopefully uh, I've shown you how that reconciles this divergence in those uh, two growth rates. And, and uh, then the other lesson from this picture is you can see that really the measure of money that matters for inflation is this broader measure of money, this uh, M2 uh, measure. So let, let me mention now a few challenges with uh, using this uh, tool. I would say there are three challenges. Um, one is that we may raise this interest on reserves too aggressively to, in an effort to cut off inflation, and that may hurt the recovery. I mean, that story I told involved auto loans. And in that story, um, when we raise that interest on reserves, the banks are going to make fewer auto loans. Well, that's going to reduce uh, economic activity from what it would be otherwise. And so if we raise that interest rate too aggressively, that, uh, as I said, could hurt the uh, recovery. So this is a potential risk. The only thing I'll say is this challenge existed um, in the old days as well with our um, main traditional tool, the federal funds rate. You know, as the economy recovered, you want to raise, the Fed always wanted to raise that interest rate to ward off potential inflation, but also at a risk of hurting the recovery. So the Fed has faced that challenge before. It just has it uh, now with this additional tool. But my point is we have some experience uh, with thinking about that kind of uh, risk. So what's the second risk is sort of the flip side, that uh, we may not raise this interest on reserves aggressively enough because we're worried about um, cutting short the uh, recovery, and then we may get uh, higher inflation. But that's, as I said, just the other side of this kind of trade-off that we face, that, we, that when, again, um, not the situation that we're in now, but at some point in the future when this recovery is going well and there is this threat of higher inflation, you now have this trade-off uh, between uh, uh, higher employment and, um, but also higher inflation versus um, lower employment and lower inflation. Again, we don't have that trade-off right now, but we could have that, um, in some sense, we hope to have that trade-off uh, in, in the future. And, um, um, uh, but my point is that this type of challenge and, and dealing with that trade-off uh, exists in the old days too. So those two challenges, um, um, they, exist with the new tool, but uh, conceptually, they're really this, the, not that different from before. There is one kind of different challenge, I would say, than uh, before. And this, um, this challenge is, is actually partly um, one reason why forecasting the economy is even harder than uh, forecasting the weather. And it's because, um, unlike in weather, uh, we can't, if, no matter how much we wish snow to happen, our wishing snow to happen is not going to make snow happen. On the other hand, um, if we think that inflation is around the corner and we act rationally based on that thought, we, that very action, uh, ver that very thought uh, can lead to uh, inflation. And so let me be a little more specific about it. Um, you know, the, the decisions that uh, households and firms make, they always have a dimension of it depends on their, you know, our expectations of the future. And suppose everyone decides, suppose we believe all these concerns we hear, you know, uh, whether they're from the left or the right, I'm now mentioning some politics here, whether they're from the left side or the uh, right uh, side of the political spectrum, uh, 
Suppose everybody decides that the balance sheet is indeed inflationary. Well, if you're a household and you think that there's inflation around the corner, when you negotiate your wage, you're going to insist on a, a much higher wage growth than you would otherwise. If you're a firm setting the prices of your products and you think inflation is around the corner, you're going to insist, or you're going to set higher prices than you would otherwise. Well, what does that do? Higher wages and higher prices will bring about the very inflation that you thought uh, uh, might happen. So there's this self-fulfilling uh, expectation uh, aspect, and that. Um, that challenge is, is out there no matter, um, the only thing you can try to do to prevent that is to simply say that, um, that uh, if you didn't have that expectation, it, it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't uh, happen. So, um, so that uh, potential is there, but um, if you look at the data um, so far, um, clearly there are not enough people who believe it um, because as I showed you, the uh, inflation rates have been uh, very low and uh, I haven't shown the data on wages, but wage growth um, uh, has also been uh, pretty low. Um, and uh, um, in terms, you know, that may not be good for all of us. We all want um, higher wage growth. But um, in terms of the Fed's uh, inflation mandate, um, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, a, a good uh, thing. So those are the challenges. And then just to summarize and uh, wrap up, the interest on reserves is the Fed's uh, main tool to ensure that excessive inflation does not uh, occur. Um, and as the recovery proceeds, um, again, not so much where we are now, but at some point in the future and we get a stronger recovery and interest rates begin to normalize, and by that I mean as they start to rise, uh, raising the interest on reserves will give banks incentive not to lend uh, too much. Um, I haven't talked about it, but the Fed actually has some additional tools uh, at its disposal to um, try to ward off uh, excessive inflation that I can talk about in the question and answer period. Um, thanks a lot for your patience, uh, but now um, I'm done and I'm happy to take your uh, questions. <laughs>